WLRN Video presents Hello WLRN listeners and supporters. My name is April No. I am a very proud WLRN Canadian member for the past two and a half years. Today I had the honor and privilege of interviewing award-winning documentarian Julia Barnes about her upcoming documentary called Bright Green Lies based on the recently published book of the same name. Julia's previous documentary called Sea of Life, released five years ago, won numerous awards, including a Water Docs Award for Emerging Filmmaker, a Cinema Verity Award in the category of Most Revealing, an Audience Choice Award at Earth Talks, and many more. Before we get to our interview, please enjoy a preview of her newest documentary. We're in the midst of a sixth major extinction of life on this planet. Paper or plastic is really not the question at this point. It's life versus a bare rock. High voltage, keep out, authorized personnel. What's going on back here? This movement that was so honorable and so impassioned has turned into something completely different. It's all become, how do we continue to fuel this destruction? There is a push for a 100% renewable world. What they don't talk about are the unseen harms caused by these technologies. You may not directly be seeing any smoke come out of any smokestacks, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Companies are involved in these activities to make money. They're not trying to displace or change other things. What they're actually talking about is sustaining high energy ways of life at the expense of the natural world. I'm not comfortable with an industry that deceives me about something as important as climate change. They claim it is good for the environment when actually it is harmful for the environment. The shit ain't green. Okay, so I'm so happy to have you on today. It's such a joy to have you on here and to be discussing this exceptionally important issue. And um, why don't we just like hop right into it and just get into like what made you want to become a filmmaker and specifically a documentarian? Um, so when I was 16, I watched a documentary called um, Revolution by Rob Stewart. And in that film, I was just learning for the first time that the world's coral reefs and rainforests and fish are expected to be wiped out by the middle of the century. And, you know, that we're in a mass extinction caused by industrial civilization. And um, I always loved nature and the natural world. And I, so when I watched that film, I was just, I couldn't believe I hadn't known that up until that point. And I, I wanted to do something to turn it around. So I went home and spent like about a week thinking about what I could do that would have the biggest impact. And I thought since I had watched a film and it had really inspired me, then maybe if I could make a film and show people what was going on, um, then that could that could be impactful. So I um, bought an underwater video camera and signed up for scuba diving lessons and just decided to make a documentary about what's happening in the ocean. Um, at the time, I had not you know, made films before, so I thought I could finish it in less than a month. I was going to go and shoot it in one location and interview some scientists, and that would be it. And it, then it ended up becoming a much bigger thing because there was just one thing after another, like, oh, I've got to talk to this person. I've got to cover this issue. And so it ended up being a three year process and yeah, turning into this like big feature film about, yeah, what's happening in the ocean. Um, so that was that was kind of cool because I got to take that film around and do screenings of it and just see the impact mm -hmm. that it could have. Um, a lot of people came up to me after and said that they were inspired to do something some people are going to like dedicate their lives to protecting the ocean just because they watched this film and they had nothing to do with it before then so that was really cool um yeah well the documentary that you're talking about is called sea of life right and it's totally it's absolutely incredible i watched it it made me cry of course like you know i'm crying a lot but it, it's so beautiful some of the same and i got introduced to like people that i'd never really known about before people who were absolutely 100% pa 
passionate about what's happening in the world as well. Um, so, but it's been five years since you made, and really you did so much on that film. Like you were like the director, the producer, you didn't do the score, but you did like almost everything else. Um, and is that sort of the same for the the new documentary coming out called Bright Green Lies? Is that like, are you basically doing it all again? Yeah. Yeah. I did oh, I perfect. For the music. <laughs> Except for the music again. Yeah. Well, the music, the score for the for Sea of Life was brilliant as well. It mm -hmm. absolutely was very moving. So what do you think, like it's been five years since that documentary came out. Oh, wait a second, actually, before we start on that, why don't you tell people how it is that they can watch the Sea of Life? Sure, so if you're in Canada, then Sea of Life is on Crave, and that's the only place that's available right now for people to watch in Canada. And then for the rest of the world, it's on a platform called Vimeo On Demand. So you can just so do people have the website um, seaoflifemovie.com and then you can get a link to where you can watch it. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So it's been five years since you made that documentary. What have you learned about? Obviously, you learned that it, it's not going to be filmed in a month, right? Yeah. Like usually, it takes a little bit longer to do it. Um, but what else have you learned about the process of like making a documentary and going about that? Um, I think I've gotten a bit more efficient in terms of interviewing people. I mean, it was a learning experience for the first one and everyone who I interviewed, like I was just getting a real education on what was happening to the ocean. But I interviewed about 50 different scientific experts and obviously only about half that many ended up in the film. Um, so I think there's less on the cutting room floor for Bright Green Lies. It's a bit more just like go in, get the stuff I need and and knowing more what, what questions to ask or who to talk to and that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the process, it's it's pretty much the same. I mean, this film took even longer to make. Um, it was four years with Bright Green Lies. It will be now four years by the time it actually ends up coming out. Um, wow. And it's, it's kind of weird because Sea of Life, I sat down and edited it and it only took two months. But for Bright Green Lies, it was, it was very different. It took about a year before I had like just a, a decent cut of it um, and then a bit more fine tuning after that but so it was a much longer editing process and I don't know why it just it's it's weird how long it takes you're just kind of shuffling things around until things like crystallize and come together and you realize oh, okay this has got to come before this and whatever um, so yeah I don't know it's interesting well, that was actually my next question. So it's a perfect segue for it. So Bright Green Lies, the book. So that's what your documentary is basically based on, right? Yeah. So authors, Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, Max Wilbert. So it goes over, I read the book. Um, it goes over a lot, like obviously. Like it goes over solar. Um, it talks about... Um, well, the lie of green uh, energy storage. It talks about wind, you know, industrial wind farms. It talks about tons of stuff. Um, how do you make the choice? Because obviously you're, you're, you know, it took me lots of days of reading, obviously, like I'm not reading it just totally straight through, but like, how do you make the choice of what, what actually gets in there? What lies to sort of debunk and, and what to not even touch on just because just for a matter of time or, yeah, it really does have to do with time when you're making a film and the nature of only having an hour or an hour and a half. Um, Bright Green Lies ended up being an hour and 10 or 11 minutes. And um, you kind of have to keep things interesting with a film. So you can't just shove everything in there or else you bore people. And, you know, I even had scenes that I ended up cutting, um, going into some of the things like the grid and recycling. And, yeah. you know, I, I had asked them about all all these kind of issues and just some of the more obscure things like, you know, LED light bulbs and just hydrogen. Like there's so many, there's so many lies that are covered. And of course you can't cover all of them in a film. So you kind of just have to streamline and be like, okay, what are the things that people have most been promoting and been like putting their hopes in? So like solar and wind are the big ones, but then also the ones that are dominating the actual you know so-called renewable energy in most countries that claim to be having high percentage of renewable energy are are really not the solar and the wind they're things like biomass and hydro so you got to cover those as well um 
Yeah, electric cars are another big one that that people think is a solution. So yeah, I just wanted to cover the ones that are kind of getting the most publicity as as things that are going to solve these problems and talk about why they're really not. Well, especially in Canada, you know, like we're we're pretty big on hydroelectric dams and these are always you know, they're always touted as um as clean renewable energy, right? Like al- almost all the time. Not not entirely. Like there's 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 organizations, environmental organizations and you know, in Canada and elsewhere that have you know dispelled the myth that these are completely renewable. But in Canada, like just where I'm from, even in Mattawa, we've got two dams probably within a seven minute drive, really a big one on the Ottawa River and then a, a smaller one, but they're really close by. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're we definitely we definitely enjoy our hydro uh, electrical. So I, I'm, I'm glad that's something um, that you can discuss in there. The other thing I want to talk about was notable environmentalists, right? Like people like Dr. David Suzuki. He's mentioned in the book for for criticizing um, people who criticize, you know, solar and industrial wind farms. Um, so how is it that you will? I'll, I'll I'll say some of the things that he said. So he basically said that uh, critics of the industrial wind farm with their blanket "not in my backyard" approach is hypocritical and counterproductive, and was quoted calling industrial windmills things of beauty. Um, he doesn't explicitly state that these are industrial wind farms, but I know he's not talking about like the little wind farms that you put together in a puzzle on the very homesteady, you know, those homesteady uh, puzzles. But anyway, so how would you address the criticism um, that you're being divisive and counterproductive from notable, um, very well-respected environmentalists, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it, that's a really interesting one because I think that if people are genuinely interested in protecting the natural world in the environmental movement, then a film that points out the harmful industries of things like renewables shouldn't be considered divisive. It should just be something that is information that they're going to take in and that's going to affect the way that they look at these issues. And if someone if their allegiance is to these technologies above life on the planet, then they were never really an environmentalist to begin with. And their allegiance is not with the natural world. Then I don't think we're, we were ever part of the same movement. And, you know, just like your body has to be able to recognize the difference between your own cells and, and foreign things like viruses and bacteria, a movement has to be able to differentiate. We have to be able to recognize when we're being colonized and co-opted we have to have measures to to sort that out so we need things like this we need to know the information we need to know that if there are people coming into environmentalism and claiming that um, this industry that calls itself green is going to save the world and if the reality is that there really isn't anything green about this industry we need to be able to recognize that we can't just you know believe everything that we're told about about these things being emissions free and clean and green and whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, if if the division already exists, then I'm happy to point it out so that we can deal with it. Perfect, absolutely. And the fact is, is that, you know, he never, I don't know, never, because this was this actually happened a long time ago. Like he wrote the article of wind, windmills are a thing of beauty almost seven years ago. It was a long time. Hopefully he's been able to take in new information from then. If not, I have decided because he really he was very formative, like in, in, in a lot of Canadians, just in terms of like he's always advocated for natural spaces, you know, up until now, really. Um, you know, he was he was just in terms of our understanding, like I remember him being at a conference and he, him refusing to drink bottled water because he said, no, if, you know, I want to drink tap water because if the tap water who, you know, all the poor people are drinking, if that is contaminated, we have to be completely outraged about that, right? So, you know, he's done so much to, just in terms of myself. I've decided that he's going to get this book, by the way. <laughs> I am going to send him this book. 
He is not going to get away with saying that windmills are a thing of beauty. Um, but it actually just, it brings me, because because that, that attitude is not ever directed towards him, right? Like that he is the one who is being counterproductive, mm -hmm. right? Or that he's the one who's being divisive. No, 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 Dr. David Suzuki, it's you who's being divisive. You know what I mean? Like, anyway, this is, anyways. So which brings me really to my next point. So like language is so important, I think, in this struggle. This is, I feel like language is the reason why this book has been written. Like the book has been written because, not because people like Dr. David Suzuki are calling these technologies, but they're calling them green, you know? They're calling them, they're, they're going so far as to say, this is in the name of environmentalism. This is in the name of saving the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a fundamental issue here on language and the understanding of it. Like green has to mean one thing. It can't mean a hundred things to a hundred people, right? Just like the same with environmentalism. It cannot mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people. We have to agree that language means something, right? Um, it certainly is the case in, in, in the feminist movement. Like right now we're being completely co-opted, um, the feminist movement. I think in the same ways that, uh, uh, that the environmentalist movement has. It, it's been co-opted by people who um, just really to serve the dominant culture, you know? Um, like even the term woman now um, it's not only just being debated, like women are not even allowed at the table to debate what a woman is. Um, so in the in the women's movement, this is obviously a big issue and obviously in, in the environmental movement as well. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on how language and how important it is in the struggle to understand what's happening in our environment, you know? Yeah, it is so important and language does need to mean something right and if you say something is green i mean how can you say that if it actually involves the destruction of the natural what does that even mean i mean i don't know we don't really have a definition for that you think it means something that's good for the planet or even you know they say that solar panels and wind turbines are going to save the planet but this is just another destructive industry that is degrading the planet so yeah, it makes no sense. And and you just, the language issues are so pervasive. Like they'll use oxymorons like um, green growth or sustainable development. And mm -hmm. I mean, green, green technology is an oxymoron, right? Like you cannot have, you cannot have extractive technologies and call them green you cannot have extractive technologies and call them environmental like those extractive economies are inherently absolutely destructive to the natural world so calling them green trying to greenwash um mining you know is is absolutely bonkers like it's totally totally bonkers mm -hmm. um anyways but it's it's but you know i i feel i feel like this is just the violation of the natural world isn't enough you know what i mean like and that's sort of part of this crazy dominant culture like it, it's it's not enough that we violate the world we have to tell everyone that what we're doing is we're actually saving the world by killing the world right like it's just so crazy it's like they the, not only do they take the physical reality of of destroying the planet they have to come back for your sanity you know what i mean like it, 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 it's just, um, it's bananas anyways. Yeah, that is really crazy. And <laughs> I, yeah, I was having a conversation the other day with, um, you know, someone who's trying to promote like bright green lies in the film. And he was, he was really noticing that there's, there's being deceived, which is happening. We're all being told that these things are clean and green. And then there's people willingly being deceived. And even when you point out to them that it's not, they still want to cling to the idea that it is and just completely ignore physical reality. And, know. you know, we're seeing that a lot. And we're seeing, like, attempts to kind of just censor the film and the message and all the press around it has been, it's just been really... A, a weird experience and um i don't know this is something that like can't even be talked about because it, it challenges the the fundamental 
um, I guess, entitlement of people in this culture. And then I guess one other thing I wanted to say about language, I, what I love about, I mean, one of the many things I love about the book is that, you know, they use um, who instead of that or Mm -hmm. it when talking about non-humans and the natural world. And they also talk about how using language um, appropriately is so important like the the co-optation of the language i mean progress is another word like that they use to 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 talk about destruction or you know development Mm -hmm. is the word for destruction and anything that's bad they try and find a word that's good to describe it that sounds good and it's so messed up and at the same time using the appropriate language is really important, but it's also not a substitute for actually taking action to, to stop that destruction. You are listening to WLRN. Oh, yeah. And and that was mentioned in the book where they talk about language. They just do like basically like a little disclaimer. But I really what I felt like the book was trying to convey is that language is absolutely important. Um, but the people who use language to resist this culture are not the only type of resistors. That's sort of what I got from that. It was just yeah. like, yeah, we're using language to try to describe what it is that we're ha- we're having. But but really fundamentally this is a, a language issue right like I, like i had mentioned to you that the the uh, provincial conservative government in alberta like a month ago decided that you know what we don't want to call it mountaintop removal okay so we're just going to rebrand it as open pit mining as if that's somehow so magically better but where they want to do it is the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And people get a little bit upset about that, right? Because this is sort of like Canada's treasure. But the, like, it's absolutely bananas. Like, and, and really, what they admitted, they admitted that, look, uh, uh, that it isn't a mountaintop removal if you only remove 90% of the mountaintop. <laughs> like, it's so crazy. Like, what do you mean? No, that's exactly what it is. It's absolutely 100% mountaintop removal and by the way the company that wants to do this um it, it uh wants to do this in the eastern slopes of the rocky mountains they're doing it for um coal mining uh metallurgic coal mining so this is the type of coal used you know almost exclusively uh for steel production which is 100 percent necessary for dr david suzuki's things of beauty you know Mm -hmm. so suck that dr david suzuki you know what i mean like (laughs) um oh i so so moving along so you mentioned in another interview that bright greens i thought this was brilliant and they talk about it in the book which i'm very happy about that they solve for the wrong variable so it's discussed in the book and i was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on um on that and and solving for the right variable. Yeah, absolutely. So the problem with all of these kind of green techno fix solutions are that the variable, the thing that they're solving for, the thing that they're they're taking as a given is this system that we have set up and this way of life and this infinitely growing extractive economy, industrial civilization. They're taking that as just that's how it is and we have to solve for how to keep this going, how to save this and how to do it in a way that's green, whatever that means. And the problem is that you're, that you're never going to get a solution if the thing that you're attempting to maintain is what is the root cause of the problem. And what needs to be central and prioritized and the right variable is life on the planet. We need to figure out how to live in a way and how to completely radically change society in such a way that that we can have a future for all life on this planet and live in balance and live according to the laws of nature. And yeah, attempting to to maintain the system that is just at the heart of all of these problems 
and that is that is causing the destruction is never going to achieve that. Absolutely. You're right. And it's it's really it's about asking the wrong questions, right? You know, like it's about asking, you know, if if the question is, how can I be smug and completely condescending to like poor people? Um, the answer is, let me buy a Tesla. You know what I mean? And if uh, if the question is, how is it that I'm going to stop the destruction of of uh, the natural world that I love so much? The the answer is not supporting extractive technologies right and that's basically i feel like the gist of the book mm-hmm. um if this was really depressing i'm not gonna lie the book itself was quite depressing and then i watched anyways and i happened to be watching another documentary at the same time that was really depressing and i was like oh my god this is so terrible and and i realized like i was i was thinking about it i was like in social work um like especially like in the field like i, I mentioned to you that i um, worked at a at a women's crisis center for a number of years, still am, but as their bookkeeper now. Um, the burnout rate is like five years, and that's just because it's really heavy stuff that you deal with. And I'm wondering, like, as a filmmaker, somebody who not only discuss you know discusses the the death of all life on the planet, but somebody who perhaps is filming it at specific times in her life, like, how is it that you avoid burnout? It's so funny because you know, I hear people talk about burnout all the time and I've actually never experienced it. Um, so I don't, I don't know a good answer to that question, except that, yeah, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't even really understand what burnout is. I, I, yeah, I haven't had it yet. So hopefully I won't. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like you became, like you became a filmmaker because of your passion, right? So this is your passion. Like, it's your passion. Like, you decided that what you wanted was, you know, you wanted to do something about coral reefs dying. Like, that's what you said. And you just decided you were you were really young. And you said, that's it. I'm picking up a, a camera and I'm going to do something about it, which is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. So I want to talk actually a little bit about the film Sea of Life and something that happened that was kind of... Um, important to me whenever I watch it. I watch it and it was kind of like one of those moments that like I had to stop it and think about it for a while. So a man named Dr. Danielle Pauly, hopefully I've got it all right, but so he discussed the concept of uh, shifting baseline. So that's that people, I'm paraphrasing, but that people adapt to their current environment by forgetting the past and making a, a like and the present making a benchmark for normal basically to assess the change that happens um which always like change always happens because we're always in a changing environment which leads to a quote gradual accommodation to the impoverishment of diversity so basically i feel like he's saying that we reach a point where we can't do anything about anything because we can't even recognize that there's a problem right like that's sort of what i was getting now mind you i was like you know i was like yeah okay yeah, totally. That's it. So this this is just like one of those questions, like nobody really needs to have an answer to it. But I thought it was it was important to sort of discuss because I thought every spring, just like as my own personal um, experience, every spring I hear like the migratory birds come up north and like everything kind of comes green again. And I spend a lot of time outside and when I see the green, like the most magical thing happens inside of me. It feels like it's embedded in my DNA, you know, like I, I get this sense. I don't know if it's serotonin or if it's tryptophan or what happens, but this most, the most wonderful things happen to my body. And I'm like, and in my brain, every single spring without fail, I think I had forgotten. I'd forgotten how wonderful it is to see that, like, you know, we have lots of conifers up north, lots of, but when the green of, of the deciduous trees come out, um, I remember that feeling. And when I when I was listening to Dr. Daniel Pauly, I thought, I thought, A, what is it that I'm forgetting else? What else am I forgetting? You know what I mean? Like in terms of those those wonderful moments when you're absolutely connected to the natural world, because through these biomarkers, whatever they may be, like for me, it's the green of the forest. So that's one, you know, um, like, how do we even know what we're forgetting? But number two, 
which I think is the most important thing, is how do we help humans or anybody collectively remember how wonderful life is when you're connected to the land base, you know? Like, especially if we don't even know what questions to ask. It was, it was, it was a moment for me where I was like, oh my God, this is like my brain. Yeah. I, I love that concept of shifting baseline. It really is like a, a mind expanding thing to think about. Oh. And um, yeah, we absolutely need to, I mean, establish for ourselves, you know, in our, the area where we live, some kind of sense of, of what is around us so we can see you know, actually taking, taking notice, how many birds are there outside my house right now? And, and does that, that change the next year and the next year? I mean, I've certainly noticed I've lived in the same place all my life. And the amount of insects has declined incredibly. But there used to be grasshoppers, there used to be praying mantises, there used to be so many more mosquitoes in the backyard. And they're gone. And that's, you know, that's something that you notice who knows how, how many there were, you know, before I was born. Um, but as a, you know, collective society and as a species, we really need to understand history and we need to look back on those records of, of the past. It's just incredible to hear some historical accounts. Um, mm -hmm. The numbers of fish that there used to be or you know, the number of sea turtles people talked about the fact that you could walk across their backs and, you know, obviously you couldn't do that, but that's how many, it was like the sea was paved with them. And, you know, I've heard that there were once so many whales that the air stunk with their breath and, you know, beaches paved with sea lions and fish that were in such vast quantities that as they moved, they would, they would slow the passage of ships. And, you know, rivers that are black and roiling with salmon and, you know, passenger pigeons, which used to be the most abundant bird species in North America, they were hunted to extinction, but there used to be billions of them and they would darken the sky for days at a time as they flew over. And we really, really need to understand how the world used to look. I mean, this is only going back a few hundred years and yeah. We need to know that so that we can not take this incredibly diminished world that we live in right now as a, as a baseline. This is not what we need to be solving for. We actually need to realize how the world is supposed to look so that we can work mm -hmm. towards that. We can't just think that this fastly degraded world, we need to maintain it as it is. We actually need to bring so much life back to this planet. It should be mm -hmm. just mind-blowingly abundant and no one should have to worry about starving because the world should be literally just full of other species who you can gather or hunt and eat. And yeah. Absolutely. And I think that you don't like, you don't ever write in the histories what you don't value as well. Right. So that's part of the piece as well. Like I think um, like you're not going to count uh whatever it may be like salamanders in my neck of the woods like whenever i was a kid and i used to explore the the backwoods you'd find salamanders different types of salamanders and they were slow moving so when you're a kid that's kind of cool you hang around them and you check them out and that sort of stuff but like it, they're almost completely gone now you really have to go into the deep woods to to find them which i do but they're not nearly as abundant as they used to be and so I think part of it is is valuing, um, you know, the the natural world as well, because you're not going to count what you don't value, right? Um, absolutely perfect. Yeah, no, and that was one of the things about the the Sea of Life documentary as well is that they, you know, they talk to people who. Well, it was just it's just so interesting to think about that. Like I'm in in northern Ontario, I'm not close to a sea or anything like that, but to think that there are that there used to be such vast quantities of, of turtles that were so massive. They were like, you know, almost, I'm, I'm not a very tall woman. So, you know, almost my height, they were like three or four feet tall. Like this is just, it's absolutely crazy. So yeah, I think it's, it's important not to set the baseline to this, to the world that we live in today as well. 
So as you know, this is this is the feminist question. So WLRN is a radical feminist community radio station. How does feminism and feminist activism fit into your view of the environment and environmental activism? Yeah, it's so there's so many parallels and I almost don't want to say just parallels because they're so like interconnected. Um, the kind of mindset that goes behind, you know, the root causes of both issues are very much the same. It's, it's like this supremacist mindset, right? So it's human mm -hmm. supremacism that is kind of the justification for the destruction of the world. And obviously it's male supremacism that is the justification for the exploitation uh, of women. And yeah, this, this kind of domination imperative that exists within this, this same culture that is at the root of, of both problems, they're completely interconnected. Absolutely. And the, the book definitely touches on some of those things, right? Like they, 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 it's kind of interspersed throughout there. And I, I think just as a feminist, like, you know, the more I've been thinking about these two issues, um, like rape, um, really is an ecological issue for me. And I know other feminists have said it, but I've been, you know, walking in the woods and thinking about it. For me, rape does something that is so terrible to humanity, really, to women and children in specific, mostly perpetrated by men. Um, what it does is it separates this. For me, this is the connection between the natural world is that it separates a woman from her body. Mm -hmm. And when you separate a woman from her body, um, almost any atrocity really can happen. But I, what I mean to say is, is that that's the most fundamental connection a human really has to have. If, if a human isn't connected to their body, um, really, they're so much easier to exploit. And they're so much easier to um, disconnect from the planet, really, right? Like, um, so for me, it's it's foundational to to healing the planet. I feel yeah, you know, we have to stop raping children, <laughs> and we have to stop raping women. And by we, I mean men. Really, mm -hmm. this is a, it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you for that. So right in the so we're almost at the end here. So right at the end of the book and the conclusion. So like almost the very first. No. It is the very first paragraph. So these are the words of the authors and not my words, but it says a false premise underlines this book. It's that people make choices based on the best available information that when they're presented with accurate and compelling facts and analysis, analyses, these facts and analysis uh, analyses inform not only their personal, but collective choices. That is of course, nonsense. So that's what the, the book is stating. And I'm just wondering if you think that films, specifically documentaries, can move people to actions, perhaps in a way that, that written words just don't do. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, certainly I've seen that films can move some people to action, but there's always a lot of people who can, you know, watch a film or read a book, take in the information, and then just go about their daily lives as if, everything's okay and I've seen that a lot too and I've definitely been very disheartened by that so I mean I tend to agree with that analysis at the back of the book I think most people don't make decisions based on rational information um, Derek sometimes says that he thinks the primary um, use of human intelligence is to justify whatever it is they wanted to do in the first place and that's pretty horrifying. Um, certainly there are some people who aren't like that and who do take in information and react to it accordingly. I think it depends on the person. And I hope that through a film, I can reach enough of those sane people who, who do make decisions that way. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's yet to be seen. Well, that really like, because you, you took in new information like at the end that's how this 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 whole your new documentary really came about is that you said 
you, you were talking at the end of your documentary to, I think it was one of the authors of the book, right? And you said, you know, what, what's the solution here? Are we going to, we're going straight forward with solar? And they said, no, 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 we don't. And then that was you. You took in new information and you made it. So obviously some people can't. It's my personal opinion, like that it, it takes a level of courage, really, to accept new information. Like I remember, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to, um, to really um, drive it into Dr. David Suzuki, but he's going to get it. He's going to get the book. He, he's getting it all. But anyways, the point is, is that I remember him saying, like, I don't know if it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. He said he was tired. He said he's tired of arguing with people. He wants to find where it is that we compromise. But the compromise, Dr. David Suzuki, cannot be, you know, destroying the planet. You cannot compromise the foundational goal of your movement. Like, that's not the way that it works. Right? Yeah. So anyways, that's just me. The people who are making the compromises are the ones who receive the benefits and the, the compromises are happening at the expense of other species who don't get a say. It's really easy to foist the, the harms onto somebody else and call it a compromise. I feel that's exactly the way that the modern feminist movement is going. You know, it's always at the expense of poor women, you know, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, it would be fine for me to say that men can be women. I'm probably never, ever going to end up in a prison. I'm probably never, ever going to end up, um, you know, in, in a women's crisis center. Women's crisis centers exist as, the, as a stop right before they go right onto the streets. Or sometimes they exist to take women and give them a little reprieve from the, the absolute horrors that are happening on the streets. But it doesn't, you know, like, oh, it does nothing to put pronouns in your bio or whatever the frig it is. Like, no, you're right. It, it wouldn't take anything away from me. Well, who it takes away from are really poor women, you know? And, and it's like, we just don't, we don't give a shit about them. You know what I mean? Just like the natural world. It's like, no, you're right. Uh, I can go ahead and, and claim them environmentalist by pretending to uh, care about the environment and support these extractive uh, technologies but it still is killing the natural world like you know what i mean exactly. anyways absolutely bonkers i'm sorry if i if i tend to rant a little bit so the other the last question really is like what do you hope to accomplish with this documentary and what do you hope people take away from from it i really really hope that we can reclaim the environmental movement like the mi mainstream side of it has been so captured and so co-opted and a lot of that has to do with um you know, funding sources, but also just big organizations wanting to present a palatable message. But I still think that most people, most individuals who are involved in environmentalism are, are genuinely interested in protecting the natural world. So yeah, I hope that when presented with this, this information, and not just people who identify as being environmentalists, but really anyone who cares at all about the future of, of life on this planet or, or other species or other people, can realize how how insane this whole thing is and um yeah start to to be biocentric again and and to really start to take action to protect the natural world not to protect the system that is destroying it well that's it too like i feel like we had touched on it earlier so just before we go and we get to the last question like i think that you know like We've kind of gotten to a place in our culture where you can you can still um, criticize, let's just say Christianity, which is quite, you know, it's big up here, right? Um, you can criticize Christianity without people thinking that it's death to all Christians, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's the same thing with the environmental movement. Like we are, if, if we say, well, criticizing extractive, technologies it's not criticizing the human what it's saying what we are criticizing is a belief system we're you're criticizing criticizing you know things that are actually harming the planet you know but it it becomes like you had said so ingrained it becomes part of people's identity so far 
It's the same thing whenever a feminist t- tries to talk about gender, really. You know, it's like if, if you do so, if you if you even mention that gender could in any way be harmful to women, you know, people get very upset about that. You know, it's because really it's like, you know, it's such a be- it's such a belief system that people hold so dear to them that it, you think trying to separate it from them means death to them, really. Right. And I think that's where the the courage part kind of comes in. It's like you have to be courageous enough to say it's okay for somebody to criticize, you know, what it is I've supported in the past. Dr. David Suzuki, you know what I mean? Like, just wake up and admit that you backed the wrong friggin' team. You know what I mean? It's terrible for the environment. Let's just admit it and move on and do something productive Mm -hmm. with ourselves, right? I don't even know where I was going with that, except I'm just, you know, rambling on. No, it's all good. Um, so, um, so how do people watch the film? Like, how is it that I'm going to be watching the film? So on April 22nd, we're having a premiere virtual streaming event. So it can be watched from anywhere in the world. You go to brightgreenlies.com and on the front page, you can sign up to get tickets. And then um, the day after that, it's going to become available on Vimeo On Demand. And on Mar- or May 16th, it's going to be available on iTunes and Google Play. Perfect. So lots of options. So for people, yeah, lots of options. So people in Canada can obviously use some of those options like the uh, Google Play and perfect. Absolutely. Um, well, I have, I have one bonus question if you want, if you want to hear it. Sure. It's a silly one, but I'm a silly person. So if um and i don't mean to be flippant about any of this so if industrial civilization if we had a big you know if if we had a button me and you right now and we could just you know um put a stop to it what would you miss tomorrow Mm. probably the types of food like ice cream i've got coconut ice cream and chocolate chip in my freezer and you know, yeah, Derek always, when he talks about um, the conveniences of civilization, he uses the phrase ice cream 24-7. And like, you know, it's not worth destroying the planet to have ice cream 24-7. But every time I hear that, I'm like, mm, ice cream. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy that while it lasts because it's not going to be here <laughs> very much longer. <laughs> I'm totally on team mint chocolate chip. I yeah. love mint chocolate chip. Yeah. My favorite, too. Yeah. Um <laughs> Perfect. I, I can't thank you enough for talking to me today. I'm so excited for your film. I mean, thank you for being, first and foremost, an amazing human being on, you know, on planet Earth and using your skill set and your passion to protect the natural world. That's just like, that's so awesome. And talking to WLRN. I hope that it's wildly successful. I hope that every uh, WLRN listener out there, you know, reads the book and and watches the film. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for being willing to have this conversation because certainly not everybody is. So, yeah, thanks a lot. They're all a bunch of cowards. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, bye. Take care. Thank you for watching this WLRN interview with Canadian award-winning filmmaker Julia Barnes. If you like that interview, perhaps you will enjoy WLRN Edition 51 dedicated to women in climate change, which features Lierre Keith, one of the authors of the book entitled Bright Green Lies. The edition is going to be linked above. I've taken the liberty to record and play for you the sound of spring peepers taken in the forest behind my childhood home just days before this interview was recorded. Enjoy, sisters.